Okay, let's start this. Uh, so, my name is Pavel Markov. I'm pre sales engineer at the company called Tufin, and I'm glad to present the next session to you. The topic is exploitability and your decisions. So, basically, how to use network insights to reduce risk. And uh, first, I want to start why we are having this conversation at all. Uh, so, uh, we need somehow to protect our valuable assets. We call them our jewels here. But basically, we are talking about information, about data. And protecting them also means uh, creating secure paths through our network, uh, securing the access to these assets. On the other hand, we don't want to overcomplicate the things. Uh, the, the, the environment is too complicated already, so we don't want to over-engineer it. And we also need to ensure that everything what is accessible is not exploitable. So these two words you are going to hear a couple of times during my presentation, exploitable and accessible. Oh, actually, I can use this one. Uh, there are a couple of challenges which I would like to highlight, uh, which most of the companies face together. So the first thing is that uh, we are dealing with a very, very complex, fragmented environment. We have the good old on-prem environment. On the other hand, we have cloud. We are adopting uh, new technologies like IoT. And this creates uh, 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 enormous complexity. And it's very, very difficult to create some kind of comprehensive and effective universal security policy. We have different security controls. All these silos, they have their own security controls, but nothing is universal. For example, we have the network. Uh, good old network. I personally also come from the network background, actually. So the network security team is focused on traditional things like to enable business, provide access for the users, uh, do the monitoring stuff. Uh, they also are responsible for enforcing compliance. On the other hand, we have the cloud guys. Uh, they have quite different perspective, you know. Uh, they are focused uh, on innovation. They are very, very agile. They take more risk. And of course, at the end of the day, typically, don't, they don't really care about security. So, this fragmentation should be addressed somehow. But before we proceed, I put here a very, very basic, uh, this is a kind of quite obvious slide. But still, I want to highlight on this. So, what means that one asset is exploitable? Basically, to be accessible and vulnerable at the same time. It's, it's really a very, very simplistic definition by the book. But how should we address this exploitability? We should prepare a plan. And this plan contains at least these basic steps. So first, we need to do classification. We have to identify our assets and uh, put some, some, some documentation there. The second thing what we have to do is identify whether these assets are vulnerable. For this, we have the good old vulnerability scanners. Then, we need the other side of the picture. What is accessible? Tufin can help you, you'll see this. And combining these three insights, we classify the assets, we identify vulnerabilities, we know about accessibility, Combining these three insights, we actually build the big picture. And we can identify which assets are actually exploitable. And, of course, uh, we want to do something about this. And uh, in the next slides, we are going to discuss the remediation options. So the most obvious one is patching, patching, patching. So we have to patch, that's clear. But Sometimes it's not possible, and uh, therefore we have to have alternatives, compensating controls, we call them. But let's go a bit, a bit into the details. 
The first step we told, I told you is classifying call sets. So there are a couple of things which, we, which are recommended to, to be considered. So focused on the important things. Put some priorities on your assets. Also, it's useful to group the assets according to their function. So uh, create, create some uh, universal classification there. You also need to know who is the owner of the asset and why this asset is needed. And of course, after we identified uh, the asset, then we need to know about its vulnerability. So for this, we have the vulnerability scanner. There are a couple of uh, pretty good vendors on the market. Uh, they can provide us this information. And then the final step is accessibility, OK? Let's figure out who can access this asset. And starting with the classification, it should look something like this, uh, like the information I put on the table. So we have first uh, owner-related information, so to, to which team belongs uh, the owner, role, name, and so on. We also have here the classification based on criticality of the asset, or uh, we have also the functional classification. For example, the asset belongs to the financial team or to the accounting and so on. Then the required asset. Uh, who, what, when needs the access to this asset? And very, very important, we need to document everything. We need to put this information into IPAM or CMDB or in worst case scenario, you can put this in Excel sheet. Here is an example, uh, very, the picture might look a little bit boring, but this is a building management system. And I just put, put it here to visualize what kind of different assets we, we might somehow deal with. So for example, you have uh, PLCs, pro programmable logical controllers, or control for the access control, or uh, other uh, types of centers for the temperature, air conditioning, and so on. This is not typical IT. But still, as you see on the top of the picture, uh, uh, traditional IT systems need to interact with this, uh, with this building management system. So this is just uh, an example for such a uh, set of assets which are really hard, uh, difficult to be classified. And the vulnerability scanning. This is also a very important part of the picture. Uh, there are a couple of uh, very good vendors on the market, Qualys, Nessus, Dinable, so on. Uh, but the challenge here is that there are also assets which are not really scannable. Uh, like on the previous picture I showed you, uh, some of these legacy systems, they use some kind of proprietary software solutions, and it might be the case you just can't scan them. It's also very important that uh, the vulnerability scanner you, you are using should provide some kind of API access. Why is this needed? Because Toofin can use this and we can infuse this information in the decision process. Remember, our topic was how to use the network insight to, uh, to, to, to influence your decision-making uh, decision process. But you will see this uh, on a short demo in a couple of minutes. And uh, one more thing uh, important to be mentioned, not every system can be patched. Uh, this is uh, from the real world experience. Uh, uh, plenty of uh, old uh, traditional legacy systems, the vendor just doesn't provide any patches. Or it might be also the case that uh, there is a patch, but you just can't deploy it because, uh, because the system is so critical that you are not getting a maintenance window. You just, you just uh, can't uh, turn it down, even temporary. And the patching is, uh, is being delayed. Or even with newer systems like the IoT devices, uh, most of the vendors don't provide reliable uh, and consistent uh, patching cycles. So, Assume that uh, you can't patch everything. And what is accessible? It's very important to know who has access, but we are not talking only about end users. 
we are also talking about other uh, IT systems, like uh, on the picture I, I showed you, uh, ERP uh, might need to communicate with all these uh, controller types. Monitoring systems need to com communicate. Or there might be other control systems like SCADA and so on. And therefore, it's very, very important to have some tool to identify what is the current accessibility to our asset? And here, until now, it was the boring part. It was kind of uh, dry theory. Here, we can help you with our solution, with Tufin. So Tufin, just a very, very uh, short introduction with a few words. Tufin is a tool for orchestrating security policies. We can orchestrate firewall rules. We can orchestrate public cloud. We can also orchestrate private cloud like NSX or uh, Cisco ACI. And because we have all these rules, we can identify uh, uh, whether our asset is accessible. Like here on the screenshot, I have cut uh, 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 from uh, uh, a picture. This is a screenshot from our uh, rule searching engine. Uh, this is a tool which can help you search inside all the rules across all environments based on various criteria. In this case, I created a search query like show me all the rules where destination contains this specific IP address, 10, 2, 2, 2, 2. And actually is allow because I'm interested, of course, in allow rules. Uh, moreover, we can also provide a graphical representation end-to-end -end about the accessibility. Because I told you, we are pulling information for various uh, types of devices. So we support firewalls. We also understand the traditional network switches. We also understand cloud, public, pri private cloud. So we can build the full topology picture. And you can use this to, uh, to make path analysis. So to verify whether the asset we are interested in is accessible from specific subnet. But let me show you this on a real demo. OK, I recorded here a video for you. This is our dashboard of Tufin. So on this dashboard, you are seeing uh, some, some relevant KPIs. I told you, because we pull all the rules from all devices. So you can see here, for example, all the rules, all the network policies configured across your whole environment. In this case, uh, in this demo environment, we have like 6,000 rules. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, we are running a couple of intelligence tests on top of this. So, for example, we identify rules which can be cleaned up or rules which are too permissive. Too permissive means uh, too unspecific. Uh, or for the cleanups, we are showing you here rules which uh, are disabled or rules which don't have hits, basically are, which are not used, or rules which are fully shadowed. So this means redundant. They are overlapping with other existing rules. But this was just, just a short teaser about Tufin. Uh, I want to focus uh, on the topic about accessibility. So in accessibility, for, we have this rule viewer. Rule viewer, as I told you, this is a search engine. So you can search inside the rules based on the criteria you define. In this case, show me the rules which contain this IP address, 10.2.2.2, and action is allow. And this automatically creates a list of all the rules which correspond to my filter, to my filter condition. Uh, let me filter further on the device type, because this is covering the whole environment, and I want just to, to see the nearest enforcement point, so the firewalls which are in close proximity to the asset. So I filtered here uh, on a specific device type, and I also want to exclude rules which are disabled, because they are not interesting, so not active rules uh, don't, uh, don't really matter. And after I constructed my final filter, I'm seeing three rules which have something to do with this asset. So the first rule is allowing from, from a subnet 50 to the subnet which contains uh, my asset, is allowing telnet. This is not a good thing by any means to have telnet. The, the second rule is some, some more generic rule some uh, containing any, therefore my asset is also included. And the third rule here is allowing from one subnet to my target subnet uh, uh, basically any services. Okay, so that was how you can use Tufin uh, to filter out the rules. 
I told, uh, mentioned the topology. So this is the representation of the whole network. It, in a complex environment, of course, uh, it, gets, it, it, it gets too complex. But I have this path analysis tool. So I can create a query to identify the traffic from, one, from point A to point B in the network on service C. So I'm uh, creating here a query from subnet 50 to my asset called uh, 10222, and the service is Telnet. And the system is showing me, first, the network representation. So this is IP reachability. I told you, we have full understanding about the underlying routing topology. Uh, so the path here goes, first, uh, 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 through one Palo Alto firewall, then it's being load balanced between two Cisco ASA firewalls, and then it reaches uh, the final destination. You see here on the screen that uh, each symbol, uh, there is a red uh, symbol uh, uh, next to the firewall, or a green symbol. And uh, this is quite obvious what it means. So red means that the traffic I've requested is blocked on this particular firewall. And I can even uh, go deeper and uh, see the relevant rules. So uh, the, from the context menu, show me the rules, and I see, OK, the traffic I requested is blocked on this firewall by the implicit deny rule. But on the other firewall, on the Palo Alto, the first hop, there is a rule which is allowing exactly the traffic I asked for. So from uh, the source subnet to the destination subnet on port telnet. You see? So you can use Toofin to get very, very detailed understanding about uh, the accessibility of your asset. OK, but that was just the first part. Uh, remember the definition I told you about exploitability? So uh, uh, an asset is exploitable if it's accessible and vulnerable at the same time. So now we have to combine all the insights. And for this, we constructed the next dashboard. This is a screenshot again from Tufin. Uh, this is a dashboard representing information about a particular asset. And on this dashboard, you see the green side on the, bo uh, on the uh, box on the first line. Uh, shows you that the asset is, uh, is protected. This means that the asset is not accessible from, from external networks, from untrusted networks. So we automatically verify this. But the asset, at the same time, is accessible internally. So it's still exploitable. And here on the dashboard, on the second line, you see this is a list of vulnerabilities associated with this asset. And this information was provided by the vulnerability scanner. And you see here a list, OK, the, this is a, this vulnerability uh, uh, which exploits uh, uh, something on port, uh, uh, on the HTTPS port. Actually, most of the vulnerabilities identified here exploit uh, HTTPS. And we also see on, dashboard, on this dashboard the, the, the closest enforcement points. So basically, the firewalls which are in close proximity to the asset and which enforce security, which enforce the access to this asset. And uh, the, uh, the last um, line actually represents relevant rules. We combine the information about vulnerability, we, combine, we also know about accessibility, and we represent you here which rules are actually causing our asset to be exploitable? So in this case, we'll see rules which allow port 443 to be accessed. But let's, again, do a short live demo on this. It's actually pseudo-live. I mean, I recorded this. But I think it gives the same feeling. OK, this is the dashboard of our vulnerability mitigation app. Uh, you see here, uh, first we are showing you uh, which uh, assets were identified as accessible and vulnerable, eight assets. Then uh, we show you which rules are relevant for this uh, exploitability. And these rules uh, are basically uh, depicted, grouped by the corresponding devices. 
So, for example, there is a Fortinet firewall, which is responsible for uh, five of these rules. Then there is another firewall. The second uh, column is actually not a firewall, it's a, it's a router, and so on. But let's go directly uh, and see further information about the, the asset. So I click on accessible vulnerable assets, and I see a list for all the assets which were reported with vulnerabilities, and each line represents one asset with vulnerabilities, and I see the relevant information. Okay, uh, IP address, okay, that's, that's boring, then impacted rules. So rules which is exploit vulnerabilities on this asset, uh, how many vulnerabilities are associated with asset, uh, which services uh, are uh, impacted by this, and the, the last but one column exposed, I told you, this is about in external accessibility, whether the asset is accessible from the internet. In this case, okay, it's blocked, but yeah. And if I click on one specific asset, uh, I see more detailed information. Again, green means traffic is blocked externally from internet, but and then I'm getting the list of uh, uh, vulnerabilities on this asset. Uh, to the right uh, are the devices in closest proximity, so firewalls surrounding this, uh, this asset, and at the bottom uh, you are seeing the relevant rules. Uh, let me scroll down uh, to see to show you the rules. Okay, these are the rules. Each line represents one rule, and uh, uh, at the far right corner, you see here which vulnerability is exploitable via this rule. So we make the connection. We correlate the information here. Okay, that was the demo. Then, Remediation options. How can we deal with the problem? So there are a couple of things we can do. First, we need to set correctly priorities. Uh, of course, assets which are uh, exploitable externally, so from the internet, from, from uh, untrusted networks, uh, should be processed with highest priority. So we should start with them. Then, of course, uh, should come uh, the internal uh, assets with, uh, which are critical. And everything else follows. So, we base the patching process here uh, around the criticality of the asset. But, patching is not a miracle, as I told you. First, uh, there is not uh, always available, there are not always available patches from the vendor, so you can't rely completely on this. And in this case, the simple rule is, if an asset is not patchable, we should assume it's vulnerable. Uh, there are also zero days. So uh, even if patching is available, it's just uh, there are some delays. You can't rely, uh, uh, as I told you, on this process. And uh, for various reasons we already mentioned, you can't patch uh, everything uh, uh, the whole time. For example, there are critical assets which, which, uh, which uh, don't allow any maintenance windows, so you just can't patch them. What is the alternative? What can we do in this case? We have asset, it has identified vulnerability, or we can't scan it, so we assume it's vulnerable. Uh, so the other option is compensating controls, or limit the access. It's quite obvious. If we can't remove the vulnerability, we just restrict the access. And uh, Toofin can help you here as well. Uh, so the compensating controls, basically, rely on workflows, on automation. I didn't mention this, but Toofin is not only a tool for visibility and for analysis. Uh, we have also another component which provides automated workflows. Automated workflows for making uh, uh, standardized configuration changes across your environment. Basically, deploy new rules with Toofin. And uh, we offer uh, various uh, workflows for this, uh, addressing uh, different scenarios, but 
Here I want, I want to focus on how to combine the vulnerability and exploitability with these workflows. Uh, so there are two simple scenarios. First, you can just remove the access, decommission the access. So the dashboard I just showed you, where the asset is, uh, um, uh, is depicted with the vulnerabilities, relevant rules, and so on, you can trigger with one click from this dashboard a workflow for decommissioning access. We saw that the asset, that the asset was exploitable on port 443. We could just decommission the access on port 443. That's the first approach. The second approach is use sandboxing. Again, for this, the prerequisite is that you have some, some defined rule uh, near to the top uh, of your rule set in your firewalls, which is used for black box, uh, sandboxing. Like the rule says something like, devices which belong to the group sandboxing uh, should be accessed only from this uh, single jump host. Something like this. Or you can completely isolate them, put them, uh, this rule could be a deny rule. And this rule is predefined. And what we can do here with Tofin is we trigger from the vulnerability mitigation app a, a workflow to modify the group which is referenced in this rule. I told you the rule should be something like deny access uh, to the group uh, sandbox devices. And we start just a workflow where the asset which, which was identified as exploitable is put into this group, into the group sandbox devices. So just with a few clicks, you actually isolate the device and sandbox it. But there is something better you can do. Uh, be proactive. Everything I've described until now is kind of his kind of reactive approach. To be proactive means use automated workflows for configuration changes. So you avoid in advance that exploitability condition is created. How you can achieve this? Again, using Tofin, we are having uh, uh, workflows. Uh, for example, for firewall change request. And in this workflow, you can infuse security-related information. And you can make this happen even automatically. So, for example, I have the vulnerability scanner. I have a request, a ticket from some user. Please give me access to this server. This ticket is being processed in Tofin. And Tofin pulls the information from the, from the vulnerability scanner and says, this is a no-go. This server has an exploitability, uh, has a vulnerability on the port you just requested. And as, as I told you, you can make this happen even automatically. So no manual intervention is necessary here. The second thing you can enforce using Tufin is compliance. Why is compliance here relevant? Remember, I told you about assets which are not really patchable, but they are still critical. At the same time, these assets might be also not really scannable, uh, like the uh, controllers I, told you, I showed you in the building management system. So we have these potentially risky assets, and we want to protect them proactively. How can we do this? Using or enforcing compliance. So using Tufin, I can create a compliance matrix. And this a compliance matrix, I will tell, OK, critical assets should be put in an isolated zone. And no rules should be allowed to communicate, to allow communication with this zone. This is not the primary use case for compliance. But this is how you can use compliance to protect vulnerable assets. And of course, the best solution would be to combine all these approaches. So I have the automated workflow. I infuse in the workflow information, for, in the workflow information for the, from the vulnerability scanner. And at the same time, I uh, also uh, uh, process the information, the compliance matrix. 
It, the compliance matrix is also considered during this decision process. But let me show you how the compliance matrix looks like. So this is again a screenshot from Tufin. We call the compliance matrix universal security policy, but essentially it's just a matrix. So in this matrix you put the zones in your environment. Whereas a zone, it's, it's quite obvious what a zone is. Zone is just a collection of subnets sharing identical security, uh, security uh, preferences. And you create the matrix in Tofin, and you put on the cells detailed description what are the requirements which should be enforced between these two zones. Like in this case, uh, uh, on my screenshot, I created a, a zone which is called critical systems, and I prohibited access from all other zones to this, to this zone. And only from one zone, which is called management, I am allowing specific protocols. For example, only HTTPS uh, should be allowed, uh, MySQL, and so on. But this is completely customizable. And then, I create this vulnerability-based change automation workflow. So workflows, uh, it's, not, it's not like a universal term, but basically every workflow uh, consists of multiple steps. Uh, I will show you on a short demo uh, how the workflows in Tufin look like. But uh, the whole idea is that in the workflow, we enclose the decision process. And in this workflow, we, uh, uh, we infuse the information from the vulnerability scanner, so uh, whether the asset requested is, is vulnerable, and we also consider the compliance matrix. So two, two things at the same time. And this workflow, again, can be even completely automated. So you can create a workflow uh, where all requests which are identified as safe, so no risk coming from the vulnerability scanner, no risk or no violation against the compliance matrix. You can even automate uh, such requests they are, that they are automatically provisioned on all relevant firewalls, on all relevant systems. Remember the topology I showed you? So basically, creating an access request, end user access request, I want access to be allowed from point A to point B over service C is the same thing we are running in our topology analysis, in our path analysis. In order for this to work, we need the full understanding of the underlying topology and network. And using this topology, we identify which firewalls are relevant for this request. We also can make intelligent decisions related to risk, as I told you. And we can also provision the rules. And this is the final demo for today. I will walk through you through this process. We are starting here, uh, again, uh, we, 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 in, in our universal security policy, or this is our compliance matrix. You can define multiple parallel matrices. And these matrices can be based on a standard like uh, ISO 27000, NERC is, this is North American stuff, probably not interesting for Europe, PCI DSS and so on. And you can make the matrix as granular as you like. So here I opened a small matrix with only three zones, high level security, medium level security and low level security. I know probably this is too complicated for the real world. I just want to show you how it works. I can also create Far more complex matrix. So this is a matrix based on the ISO 27 standard. And there are a couple of zones here, uh, like nine zones, and each cell represents what is allowed between the zones. Again, these are not real rules. These are only compliance requirements. And let me select one specific cell to show you what is con configurable here. I can create an allow list or a block list of services which are allowed to be configured between these two zones. I can add here, for example, another, uh, another service, uh, HTTPS. Also, I can explicitly request that the rules must have ex explicit source, destination, or service. 
So it's not allowed to create a rule between these two zones which contain any. And I can also create uh, a requirement that the rules are in the format host to host, single host source, single host destination. And after I create the matrix, this matrix is being evaluated against my existing rules. And there is a dashboard here which depicts uh, the different types of violations based on severity. Uh, they are also grouped per device or per matrix. You saw I had like 20 parallel matrices here. Let me see uh, the violations about one specific device. When I click on the device again, I'm seeing our rule search engine. In this case, the rule search engine show me, shows me, okay, these are the rules on this specific device which cause violation critical. And if I click on a specific rule, there is a tab called violations. And here I can see detailed information. Okay, in my matrix, my rule actually describes communication between Toronto zone to, to data center zone. And there is an allow list between these two zones and the service which is in the specific rule is actually not in the allow list. So this rule is causing violation. This is kind of reactive approach. You create the compliance matrix and then Tufin will automatically tell you which devices uh, are having rules which violate against your compliance. Okay. Uh, but uh, where I'm now, kind of this screen is too small, I'm not seeing very good actually. Okay, now I wanted to show you the uh, workflow process. So this is the second component of Tufin, which is called Secure Change. This is a component about workflows. So we have uh, a, numerous, uh, a number of predefined workflow templates, but probably the most interesting would be firewall change request workflow. So workflow for requesting access. And this workflow uh, consists uh, in our template uh, of eight steps. Okay, you can customize this, you can add additional steps, you can add, if you want, four R principles, so multiple different approvals. It's completely customizable. And let me show you a ticket which was processed according to this workflow. So now I'm opening, opening one specific ticket. And uh, this ticket, I will walk you through the ticket uh, across all, uh, all, all steps. So the first step is the end user is creating a request. I want from point A to point B over service C. So some, some IP addresses sources, another IP addresses destinations, and the services. Quite simple. Then we have some approval administrative step, uh, which is step two. And step three is actually identify target. So based on the topology I showed you, we are able to figure out which firewalls are relevant here, which firewalls need to be touched in order to achieve this, this change. This is, again, based on our understanding of the topology. And uh, we are here vendor independent, so most of the, the well-known firewall vendors are supported. And then we reach step four, which is risk analysis. I told you we are doing risk analysis based on two things. First is the compliance check. So let's verify the request against, uh, against the topology, against the matrix I showed you. And I see that in my request, there, are, there is access which violates against, against the conditions I've put in the matrix. And you can see here detailed information. Okay, this actually describes uh, communication between uh, zone A to zone B. And between these two zones, actually, I have put in the matrix that everything should be prohibited. Then the second part. How to use the information from the vulnerability scanner, which I think probably might be more exciting. So I can click on the report, and I'm seeing the relevant uh, detailed details coming from the vulnerability scanner. Again, these are the, uh, uh, the vulnerabilities identified uh, uh, on the hosts, which are in our access request. All these vulnerabilities, they also have uh, on the second column the associated port, because most of the vulnerabilities are associated with some port. And they're also classified, they are ranked uh, based on their score coming from the vulnerability scanner. So in this case, I am seeing that uh, this request 
will exploit two high level, uh, two high vulnerabilities and, and nine medium. Then I can proceed with the workflow. It's up to your preferences whether you want to reject the ticket because you saw that the ticket has uh, some risk associated with this. You can create, for example, conditional escalation steps in Tuvin workflow. You could, you could say, okay, if there are some risks identified during the risk analysis, please add additional workflow step. And this work ste work workflow step will involve, for example, security review team. And they will have to take a look at our ticket and make a decision whether they want to ignore the ticket or they are, they are going to allow it. And from this moment, actually Tufin can proceed with the deployment. We can commit the changes for you, sparing you the manual effort. But I think the biggest advantage here is that the workflow process is aware of the risks. So, remember what was uh, our topic, how to use network insights to, in to influence our decisions. That is exactly what Tufin is doing. And I believe this was uh, my last but one slide. Yeah. Again, uh, if I managed to make you curious to gain your interest, please go to our website, go to Tufin.com, read about uh, our solution. You can request a personal demo. So if you are lucky, I will be the one delivering it for you. But for sure, we can make for you a tailored version of the demo aligned with the business case you are having. And I've put here some, some, some marketing relevant information. As you see, we have a significant footprint. So, top insurance companies, pharmaceutical, banks, uh, care manufacturers, the over half of the Fortune 50 companies. So, we have a significant footprint and a lot of big enterprise companies are working for, with us. And there is a reason for this. Once again, w one more time, thank you for your time. If you enjoyed my presentation, Please don't forget to rate it in the inventory app. And if you have any further questions, just stop by our booth. I'm here today. Or, as I said, just uh, uh, go to our website and request a personal demo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.